as, uh, as Jubal comes up, let's uh, go ahead and pray together for him. Lord, we thank you. Uh, we thank you for uh, Jubal and his uh, willingness to do this and his great perspective and, and then just his love for the word. Um, we pray that you would uh, help him to uh, focus on what he studied and, uh, and we pray for the rest of us that we, would, that we would hear the words that you would like us to and that we would remember and that our lives would be changed. Um, and I pray again, Lord, that we would just love you more and more every day. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. For me? Yeah. Thanks, Dan. For that prayer. Uh, if you don't open up your Bibles, if you remember back two weeks ago, it's a long time now, uh, I started talking about the book of James. And I'll be continuing in James this morning. So if you'll open up the Bible to James chapter 1 while I get all my stuff ready here. Uh, but before I get into that, those of you who were here last week, Jim Allred spoke. I just didn't see him this morning, so I'm a little sad, but maybe he'll watch the YouTube video. I just want to thank him for, again, his willingness to speak. I've always enjoyed uh, his messages and, and everything that he has to say. Um, just been a real blessing that he's been able to you know, come to Fairview and, and be here over the, the last week. So we've been going through a lot of the different things we have. Um, and last week he talked about being a saint. Uh, and, and just the reminder that it's, it's God who ultimately makes us saints, not a man's choice or, or the voting of a group of people after you die. But two weeks ago we started talking about James. And for those of you who can remember that, we talked about trials, and we also did elder selection, so I tried to mesh those two together for the fun that we'll hopefully be having over the next three years. Uh, but, but we talked about these trials and about how when we're facing these things, if God is not our foundation, then we won't be able to persevere through these things. They'll tear us down, and, and we won't be able to get where we need to be. You see, in James, it says that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And this is in verses 1 through 4, for those of you who have it open there. The testing of your faith produces perseverance. And when perseverance finishes its work, then we may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And, and we expounded on that, that idea of not lacking anything and being mature and complete with the 23rd Psalm. And in that, we saw that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When God is our foundation, we're not lacking anything. Our needs are all met when God takes care of us. And, and when he's our foundation, we don't need to build on anything else but him. When the Lord is our shepherd, his rod and his staff, they comfort us. It says, even in the face of our enemies, we have nothing to fear, for, for God is with us. And ultimately, when we walk through the shadow of death that all of us will one day walk through, when God is our foundation, through that, we do not need to be afraid. Now, I was asked by a couple people, uh, some of you may know already, but Wednesday is what we call Veterans Day in America. And I just wanted to take a moment before uh, we pray and before we get into the next step of James to just thank all the veterans and if we have any here this morning just that they'd be willing to to stand up and we can kind of congratulate them for their willingness to serve our, our country in that way. Mike didn't want to stand up if he's the only one. Well thank you. Thank you guys for your willingness to serve our country in that way. And with that and, and a quick review, let's just take a word, time for a word of prayer and, uh, and we can go into James 1.5 and, and start talking about the topic of doubt this morning. Let's pray. God, we just thank you so much for 
just the, the blessings you've given us, God. We thank you for the willingness of those men to serve our country in that way and provide us the freedom that we know and enjoy, the freedom that we can gather here this morning and worship you without fear of persecution or attacking from our own nation, God. We pray that, uh, we pray that you would just be with us over these next, next weeks and, and months, God, that as different situations arise in our lives and different problems occur, that we would set you as our foundation, God, that as we go through those trials, as the things of this world just beat us down, that you would be where we fall on and, and where we rely on. And I thank you for your willingness to, to love us, God, in, in spite of our sin and our, our downfalls, that you have chosen us and set your son on the, on the cross to die for us. And I pray that, that we would just honor that and respect you and glorify you as God of the universe. And I pray that our lives would just be a living sacrifice to you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, while I grab a drink, if you'll open up, make sure your Bibles are at James 1, verse 5, and that's where we'll be starting. <sighs> Voice is a little dry this morning. So, verse 5 starts, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who generously gives to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Now we have quite a lot to unpack within these four verses from, from five to eight. But when we start in five, we see him start off straight out of the gate. If any of you lacks wisdom, and that's, that's a really interesting statement from James is there anyone here who can relate to this? Anyone here lack wisdom? Maybe a show of hands. Any? One, two, a couple. I was thinking there would be a few more, but we'll see, we'll see what happens when we get into it. But, but we, we, we know what that is like, right? We, we lack wisdom. We go into situations that we would say, you know, maybe we're in over our heads, right? <laughs> We've all been there. And, and for me... For those of you who, who know me, I'm quite a confident person, right? And I can confidently say that I lack wisdom all the time. And if there's ever a moment in my life where I think, no, I've got this figured out, no problems, I just have to wait a few minutes and my kids or my wife gladly remind me that I lack wisdom. And I think a lot of you can, can relate to that as well. And, and so with this lack of wisdom... We, we see here that James wants to talk about this peace, this wisdom. And, and maybe when we look at the Bible, wisdom can be a really broad word, right? We can use it for a lot of different circumstances. And this morning, I kind of want to hone in on, on wisdom being understood as the ability to apply knowledge. So we have knowledge and we have wisdom. Knowledge is knowing what it is that we have, you know. It's the, the raw information, the intellect of it. But wisdom is the actual ability to use that to do whatever it is that you need to do. You might have a knowledge about math, but maybe physics would be the wisdom of the fact, applying it to whatever it is that you're trying to solve the problem of. And that's the piece of wisdom I guess I want to talk about here. So if we look at this in the context of, of trials and what we had talked about two weeks ago, we need to have wisdom, we need to have the ability to apply knowledge in the face of trials that are coming before us. So this wisdom is the ability to use knowledge to make it through these trials. And as we talked about, we will be tested, our faith will be confronted with trials, and, and when that happens, we need to rely on God as our foundation and rely on his wisdom that that we're asking for to get us through these trials that we come, come to. So, so if we lack wisdom, as I said, we're supposed to read the next part of James, right? We're not supposed to just give up on the trials. James says we're supposed to ask for wisdom when we lack it. In the second part of that verse, it says, where was I? Uh, it, it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask of the Lord and he will give it to you. And this 
Seems really simple, right? Like, all of us said we lack wisdom. Why? The answer was right here before us. All we had to do was ask of the Lord, and, and none of us would have this problem. But it doesn't always work out that way. You know, it's, it's simple because we look at God, right? He's the supreme creator, you know, ruler of the universe. He's omniscient. He knows everything. And he says, if you need wisdom, just ask me for it. I'll give it to you, no problem. Yet we all still find ourselves in situations that we don't know how to get through or, or overcome. Because, because ultimately, when a trial comes against us, we, we don't know how to respond. And, and maybe this trial, you know, it's, it's many different things. A trial can be, you know, someone having a differing biblical view than you, right? We have all these different denominations, whether it be Lutheran or, or Mennonite or there's a lot of other ones, but I won't go into that. <laughs> the list would be too long, it'd take all morning. But we have all these denominations, and they're different, right? Because, well, this person's interpretation of this verse is different than that person's interpretation of that verse. And, and so it causes these rifts to happen. And that tests our faith, that puts us in a trial of our faith. And, and when we come into these things, this is what James is talking about here. This is when we need to ask God for wisdom on how to get through these trials. The difficulty that I always face when, when having this is usually I, I have one single approach that I take. It's called the beat my head against the wall until I get through it approach. And maybe some men out there can relate with that approach. And, and that, that, that's what I do, right? I I come to this thing, and I just blindly say, I believe this is the way it is, so it's your problem, not mine, basically. You know, I, I constantly, I don't look at scripture, I don't back myself up, I don't do the things that are necessary to expound on why it is this way, I just, this is the way it is, that's what I believe, and, and that's the way we're going to move forward. But instead, if I looked at this, if I knew what James had wrote here, and when these situations arise, when this conflict comes, when these trials and tests come upon our lives, what do I need to do? I need to seek God. I need to ask Him. I need to seek His wisdom in these things that are coming against my faith. And, and maybe this is difficult because the trial is really long, right? Maybe the trial, it's a whole day. Well, you got to spend a whole day in prayer with God to get through this trial. That would just be the worst, right? Or maybe, maybe this trial is a month long. Or, or maybe the trial is, is an unruly child and it's a lifetime long. And, and how do you constantly and consistently seek God through all of this time? But that's what James is telling us to do. He's saying, seek God, ask him, and he will reveal to you his wisdom. He will carry you through these trials. And, and think about if it is these long-term situations. Think about how humble God can make you from having to seek him over this whole time. Right? God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Don't we want that? And so when these trials of of situations come against us that we can't overcome when we can come to God over and over and over again in the example I love that Jesus gave us this parable of the nagging woman right who constantly comes before the court comes before the court day after day after day after day after day and then finally the judge is like all right all right all right I'll, I'll get the case through I'll get it I'll deal with it because of your incessant coming before me well that is us coming before God. That is when we're in these trials and facing these things. That needs to be our mentality about it. No, God, you're not getting off the hook. You said you would give me the wisdom I needed to overcome this, and I'm not backing down until you do. That should be our mentality when we're facing these trials, whether it be for a day or whether it be for maybe a lifetime. Now, sometimes... We, we also try a different approach, and, and other people try this. I stick mainly to the beat my head against the wall approach, but sometimes we try the my way or the highway approach, right? Where we try to take this, this above everyone else approach that clearly I have more intellect, and so I obviously have the right answer. Now, it can be very similar to the beat your head against the wall approach, but there are some slight differences that, 
that come with this. And usually it's the fact of, of ignorance, right? To beat your head against the wall, usually you hear someone else telling you that you shouldn't do that. You just keep doing it anyways. But the my way or the highway just ignores what everybody else has to offer and, and goes with what it is that you are confident about. But within all of these things, ultimately, as we ask God, we need to remember to be persistent in prayer. We need to push off these habits that we can have of, of thinking that we can get through these things on our own and rely on God and his wisdom. Because God generously gives to all of us who ask. We need to be persistent. We need to have consistency. We need to be confident of what we're asking and we also not need to not demand of God anything, right? We need to be humble in coming before God. We need to seek him as God. It says, ask God, not demand of God. And we need to, to remember that sometimes because it can be easy to think of him as, you know, this vending machine. I put my quarter in, I need to get the return out that I demand. But that's not God, and we, we don't want that to be God. God is a divine being and we must come to him as the creation of himself that he ultimately created us and we need to come before him with reverence when we are asking for these things maybe it's like a child coming to a parent right climbing up in his lap and and just snuggling in and, and wanting to spend time with him not looking for his billfold that should be the mentality that we come before God when these trials come up in our lives and we're seeking him for wisdom. But within these trials, there's also another hurdle that we have to try and figure out and, and get over. And that is the topic of, of doubt and how we avoid doubt. And that's, I guess, the main piece of, of what I wanted to talk about this morning. Now, some people might label their sermons faith, but I labeled my sermon doubt because that's the kind of person I am. You'll get to know that a little bit more as I, as I am up here more often. But, but this doubt, James says that when we doubt, we are like a wave in the ocean tossed about every which way. And you may see that on the front of your bulletins this morning, right? We're this wave in the ocean. We do not know where it is that we stand, or, or what it is that we believe. And James goes so far as to declare that a person who doubts should not expect to receive anything from God. You see, doubt, it is the ultimate enemy of faith. It's the enemy of your prayers. But why? Why is doubt such a big thing? Why is it such a big deal? You know, we all live life. We have doubts of things, right? It's not an unknown thing to us. It's, it's commonplace. But, but how often does doubt really affect the ultimate outcome of what it is that we're interacting with? What forces are at work behind this piece of, of doubt that really affect the way that we live? And why are these forces opposing Christianity and us actually such a problem? You know, we read the Bible and we see if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. And if you doubt, don't expect anything. Why is there this clash, this conflict between these two opposing forces? And why do we see it so prevalent in Christianity? Well, I think that a piece of the problem is, you know, we try to compare it to things that we have in life, right? Let's, let's take, for example, a vehicle outside, right? I can doubt the entire walk out to my vehicle that it's going to start, put my key in, turn it, and it'll start right up, right? That car does not care in any bit how much doubt or faith I have when I'm walking out to it, right? I need three things, let's say. I need gas, I need oxygen, and I need flame. As long as those three things are working and, and doing what they need to, and I start that key, doubt has no factor in that matter. Those three things are required, and away we go. But, but is that how the foundations of faith and doubt work? 
right? Because it's the same thing. My faith, if I don't have one of those three things, I don't care how much faith I have. I I walk out there, that car's not going to start. It's just the reality of it. You know, we have science that says these things will happen. For those of you who don't know, I'm an engineer, so I like that, right? I know that this plus this plus this will always equal this. It is what it is. There are rules that define it, laws of thermodynamics. Every time it's going to happen. And so we have these rules behind this science behind why that works, but, but how does that happen in faith and doubt? What are the rules and the laws that, that guard what it is that if you have faith this way, then it works, or if you doubt like this, then it doesn't? Well, being an engineer, I said, let's, let's look at the place we figure those answers out, right? The Bible. Because, because we know God built a world of order. God put things in place and set things in place that work the way he created them to work. And so even within this faith and doubt, we should see some consistencies, some foundations of how these things work, some rules to live by within them. Now, if you really do figure all these rules out and and have all that, come talk to me because I would love to know how it all works. I only pieced through a few different things this morning, but the, the number of verses that talk about this is very substantial. We don't have enough time to get through all of that. But I, but I, I want to start with faith, right? I like to start with the easy one because there's a lot of verses on faith in the Bible. Like, a lot, a lot of verses. So, in our walk with Christ, faith says, well, Hebrews 11.1. Many of you would know that verse. What does it say? It says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And maybe you know a different version of that. But ultimately, what it's saying is that Christ, God, is real. And our faith in him tells us that he's real, even if we have not seen him. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We have this book, we have our life experiences that say God is real. Even though we can't walk with another person and point at something and necessarily be a pointing at God. We can look at the world around us, right? We can see these evidences of it, but not necessarily it individually. And and faith is is that. It's saying, because of these evidences, I have faith that the ultimate thing behind them is real. And God isn't the only thing that we do that with, but but now that we've defined faith, let's see if we can find some of the rules of faith, maybe some laws of faith. We see later on in Hebrews, it says, Abraham believed, or he had faith, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And in Ephesians, we see a similar thing to this. It says, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. We see righteousness, we see saved. And here we can find maybe the first law of faith. It's that faith saves, right? We see that Abraham had faith And it was regarded to him as righteousness. It's by grace you've been saved through faith. Faith is an essential piece of this. And and within that, we see that faith allows or enables or whatever word you want to use, Jesus' blood to cover our sins and to allow his blood to forgive us from all of those things. So ultimately, one day we can live in heaven with God. You see, God's grace, the son that died for us, and our faith are both necessary for our salvation. This is a law of faith. But maybe the question then isn't if you have it, but how do you get it? How do you get faith? Right? How does that work? And and maybe we can find a rule regarding this. Well, Romans chapter 10. We just went over this maybe a month or or two ago. It says, faith comes by hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of God. 
So we see how we get faith. And how is that? We get faith by hearing this word, by the preaching of the gospel. That's how we get faith. That's one way we get faith. And we've talked different times about many different ways we get faith. Maybe it's by God's divine intervention. We, we look at Paul's life, right? The Lord came and spoke directly to him. He heard the word of God and his faith was exploded from that and, and we have these books of the Bible because of it. Hearing the word of God brings faith. That's another law of faith. But let's flip the script for a little bit and talk about doubt. Because, because if faith has these laws that govern it, I'm guessing doubt does as well. In Romans, again, Romans has got all the good stuff. That's why we talked about it, I guess. It, Paul says, the man who doubts is condemned if he eats. Because his eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. Now, this context is talking about the different foods that the people would eat. Maybe it was a food sacrifice to idols, right? And, and the people had a lot of controversy over that. And Paul's like, look, look, look. If you're convicted about eating this food sacrifice to idols, do not eat it. That's the problem. The food isn't necessarily a problem. You being convicted of sin in it is the problem. This doubt you have is the problem because everything that does not come from faith is sin. So doubting God is ultimately, it's worthy of condemnation because sin leads to death. And anything that does not come from faith, which was what we would call doubt, is sin. And that's a law of doubt that we see in Scripture. Doubt leads to condemnation. And as we have already looked in James, in verse 6 it says, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. So doubt, it makes us like a wave in the sea, blown about whichever way the wind goes. And, and to define that, it would say doubt is foundationless. You see, faith is putting your foundation on something specific. Doubt is saying, I don't know anything in regards to it. Faith is picking and choosing, this is what it has to be, whereas doubt is saying, it can't be any of those things. It's not choosing anything. And so this doubt, isn't this foundationlessness, is another rule that we see within doubt. And so now we have a few rules of, of faith and a few rules for doubt. And, and if we look in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it kind of brings all of this together. It says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to or because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You see, faith and doubt are so relevant because God says they are. God says, if you do not seek me with faith, then you do not believe that I am. And if you do not believe that I am, your eternity ultimately is going to be apart from me. The reward for seeking God through faith is eternity in heaven with him. You see, God's laws, they demand a relationship. Faith ultimately demands a relationship with God. And you cannot have faith if you do not know him. If you have not heard of him. If the word of God has not ultimately been revealed to you. Doubt makes us like a wave in the ocean. It has no foundation, has nothing secure to stand on. Whereas faith, faith allows us to stand on him securely. Now, now maybe some of you weren't here the last few weeks and, and you want to know this really important question now. How do I make God my foundation? Right? If doubt is leading to all those things, how do I get away from that? How do I make God my foundation? Or, or maybe it's not that. Maybe it's the recent rises in coronavirus cases. Maybe it's your own 
mortality coming out. Maybe it's the recent election results or where all of that is standing. Or maybe it's just something completely different in life that has brought you to the realization that the foundation you're standing on is not stable. You cannot stay there any longer. It is collapsing under your feet. And so you're asking, how do I make God my foundation? Now, last week, I think Jim did an awesome job when he talked about this. And and that's maybe what reminded me how important this is to continually present to the people, even in the church. 